you're listening to Gav needs to know So Nick, good morning. Morning, Gav. So we today we've got a bit of a a, a role reversal here. Um, we've got uh, myself, Gav Megson, and I'm going to be speaking to the host of Nick Wants to Know, and he's going to talk to us about his career. Um, I'm scared. <laughs> <laughs> but before we go into that, I'd like to uh, first of all congratulate you, Nick, um, on your you. successes so far. I've been listening to uh, pretty much all your podcasts, if not all of them, and you've had some good guests on and some really, really good feedback that I've heard uh, you doing this. So, first of all, congratulations on this. But let's leave the congratulations alone and uh, let's speak about you. Yeah, well, first of all, thanks for that. But it is obviously down to the guests who I have on. So, uh, I do appreciate everyone that appears or guests on one of these podcasts because I don't make the content. Content comes from you guys. So, thank you for that. Uh, but yeah, Gav, um, what is it you want to know then? So first of all, let's uh, let's speak about Nick. Nick needs to know, Gav needs to know. Let's go back, let's go back to uh, when you left school. What did you do after you left school? So work-wise, um, I kind of fell into working with my dad. Uh, he was a bricklayer builder and uh, that was kind of the thing that was expected of me. My brother did it as well when he left school a year later. We both went and worked with our um, dad on, on sites and various house builds and stuff like that. But I didn't want that. I kind of thought, I need to find something for myself. Um, stepping out of your comfort zone, stepping yeah. out of the trend, yeah, of following the father roots, brother roots, the family roots of work. Yeah, and I didn't, I enjoyed it, but I didn't, I didn't want it. I thought there was more to more to life than following a set path. So I kind of went off and one of the first jobs I ever remember having, like not working with my dad, was in a shoe shop in Burton's. That's different. Yeah. So that was that didn't last very long, but it was eye opening. So the shoe department in Burton's is owned by I think it was Lloyd's shoe company so it, it looked like it's in Burns to the to the average customer but it's a different it's a different entity to yeah, Burns yeah. itself it's like a little shop within a shop right. um, and that really opened my eyes because you know for coming from a school environment and working with you, your family you, you don't really mix outside of that environment with other people and then me going into that shop environment seeing different people and you know trying to find out what their needs were. That opened my eyes. So I did a lot of cover work for that. Um, I was kind of the holiday cover. So traveling from Doncaster to Sheffield. Wow, yeah. To, right, okay. to Derby on train and stuff. And, and only you young. was, I guess you were 16, 17, 18 around this time? Yeah, I will have been, yeah. So when I left school, I went and did a, a public service course. Which is? Um it's a course that kind of gets you ready for the services. So, like, if you want to join police or if you want to join army, fire brigade, anything like that, that's the that's the course that people were doing at the time. Right. I don't know if it still exists, but it was just, it, yeah, it was just a, a it was just a piss about, Gav. You know what I mean? It would you with your mates, couple of your mates from the <laughs> same school. Well, yeah. Just, well, this just, is it. Isn't yeah. It? Question on this: So when. When you, when you, like you say, your dad and your brother were in the building game, mm -hmm. and you said that you didn't want to want to do this and sort of cutting that trend of you know following your following your your father etc. or family sort of work. How how did that go down? Did we were, were you confident in you know telling your dad that you didn't want to follow the route of of the trend because we know our fathers like us to mm. you need to do what we do you know and that's how it used to be you know. Yeah, I don't think there were much of that. Um, I always looked at my dad as, as a successful man, which he was because he spent a lot of time in management and leadership 
I guess in his earlier days, when I were at school, still like as a, as a young kid, I always, I always remember him never being there. He were always away. Uh, he, always grafting, providing. Yeah, and always down in London. He spent a good a good portion of time in Zimbabwe. Right. Um, and he were doing a lot of management work. Okay. And and there were odd times where you'd you'd spend a weekend with him to go on, you know, spend a day at on site with him and see what mm. he actually did and stuff or. And I thought, yeah, it'd be nice if I could. I don't think there were no, yeah, there were no pressure from my dad to get into that. But I think there were more pressure on myself to try and make my dad. To, so, yeah. to flee the nest, I guess. Yeah, you know. to try and make your dad proud. I, yeah, think. Yeah. I think it's that old cliche thing yeah, that you want to you wanna try and make your dad proud. And I never saw that opportunity while I was working for him. Yeah, yeah, because he, because he knew what to expect yeah. of you, I guess. Yeah. That was a good shout. And I did I did do it for a long time and you know, once the once I'd done the dip my toe in the outside world of working, you know, not with my dad and not mm. with my brother, I always ended up coming back to it. Right, yeah. You Comfort know, it, blanket with that. Possibly, yeah. Some familiarity it, with your father. It was, it was easy money mm. because you guaranteed work you, you could Let's be honest, if you're on a building site and your dad's like running it, mm. you're going to take piss. You, you can get away with murder. You know what well, I mean? So, yeah, it depends. Like, like, I suppose that's quite a a thing to say, but that could probably go both ways as well. Because, like you say, you you know, you, with your father, you could do that. Yeah. You know, and that probably is testament to your father of the probably the relationship you had. You know, you had a good relationship there, obviously. Well, me as a father, you know, my kids probably won't get away with that. Mm. It probably be the, the real reversal. And I'm not saying I'm an hard faced person or all, mm-hmm. but that's a good thing. So yeah, Nick, so we've, we've, we've dipped us to we dad and his business, you know, taking the Michael, as you said, yeah. and then we jumped into retail. So from there you were in retail and how long were you in retail for? Like I say, one, it was not very long at all. Um, <sighs> Maybe maybe even just two or three months. I, I did not like it. Like I said, I, I always found myself either I don't know what it was, why the pull was there that to get me go back to go back to me um, dad and working on doing what he's doing. But they, that were always there. That my brother were. I they I was I, I, I getting trains at like six in the morning, hmm. and I'm earning less than half of what my brother's earning. Right. And he's getting a lift to work. And I thought, well, that's that's maybe a big enough pull to pull me back, sort of thing. So yeah. I always went, like I, said, I always went back, and it was two or three months then. Um, and then again, back on sites with my dad, and I did that for a, quite a while because uh, we were earning some good money, um, mm. and we were fortunate enough that we didn't have a trade coming out of school, um, but we always laid bricks and helped my dad when he was laying bricks. So which is quite a skill, yeah, and. That that got let's say accredited mm. on site on a job. Um, obviously, we learned on we learned on the job doing it, but then we actually got our I think it was MVQs or something like that uh, on a site in Sheffield once um, because we had to, that was the requirement, and they were bringing like tutors out and they were looking at your work and stuff, and then they'd sign you off as a, an official bricklayer. And that's that that is how I got my trade. A lot of people obviously go to college and yeah, yeah. night school and such to learn That's it, but right. we were fortunate enough to. And, and if it wasn't for me, I don't think we would have been able to do that because obviously he get got us in the door, got the foot in the door, yeah, for us to blag it, I guess, to start mm, with. Good. So we're in. So you've 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 jumped back and forwards. You know, you've yeah. jumped. You've you flee the nest. You've tried something different. You spent three months in retail. Um, what were next, Nick? What were next? Uh, next was cutting ties again, I guess. I did I, I did not want to... I still had that urgent, urgent back in my head to not work with my dad. Mm. I wanted to do my own thing. I, I, and I left home pretty early. I think I left home at around 17, 18. Right, um, yeah. Similar race to myself, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, and I always wanted to do my own thing. So I set off on my own, doing my own... Uh, sort of building work and stuff like that um, and I always remember I had a while I was working on sites and stuff I had a 
uh, Ford Focus ST 170. Yeah. And when I decided to go on <laughs> How my many own, points? Zero points, mate, which is another story because, I'm, you know, we'll get to that. But, yeah, um, I did a C-170 Ford Focus. I, I, I just loved it. And it were, it were like, I cleaned it like three, four times a week. <laughs> and it, you know, it would clean his car on the street every day. Proud and joy. And then when I decided to go on my own, yeah, well, uh, when I decided to go on my own, I had to sell the car um, to buy a van. Um I didn't know what I were going to be called, it, whether it were going to be called Nick Builders or whatever, but um, when I sold the car, I think I actually chopped it in uh, for the van. I got a brand new Renault. I um, can't remember what it was called. It was a big van anyway. Uh, and I decided to call myself Focus Property Services. Right. So that's where that name came from. Oh, very was good. Because I, I did not want to get rid of that car. I loved it. Yeah. But I had to. Because yeah. I thought you've got to, I've got to make a sacrifice if I want to move away from what I'm doing. Speculate to accumulate, yeah. Yeah, I have to cut some off to, to to gain something else. So that's what I did. I made that sacrifice then. Um, at the time, you, you you think you're losing you're losing an arm and a leg. Yeah, you're getting yeah. rid of a car at that age. I mean, I were only like. And was this your first car? Uh, no, it wasn't. I'd been through a couple of cars. But um, this was the first car that Nick liked, yeah, I guess. Yeah, yeah, it was. A little um, sports car, you know. Yeah. It was. Um, Worked hard to get it? Yeah, I did, yeah. Um, and like I say, I, I, I just had to do it. So mm. I got rid of that. Started doing focus property services for a bit and was doing all right, doing my own thing. Um, then obviously I, I was with a, a girl at the time. Um, moved, I'd moved in with her. She had her own house. And I, I think I took on too much responsibility because I was still very young. At that time, and how old were and how old were at this point? Early twenties. Early twenties. Like early twenties. Like um, I remember going to Vegas for my twenty first, um, and yeah, I, I I think I just took on too much, too soon. It just that that probably that's probably your ambition, you know, to do well. You know, I think I think we've all had them times in our lives when we've just taking on too much and we try as a, you know, we try as much as we can. We, it might just not just be work. It could be a lifestyle, you know, and everything mm. else, but then everything. Yeah. That there's a time when you think, right, we've got to, we've got to slow down. And yeah, you say that now and that's with hindsight, but I didn't. Right. I did not slow down at all because I did not see it. And I think that came with age. Right. And being a bit naive. Well, you're young. Yeah. And you think, you you think, you think you're in, you're in, in indestructible. Like yeah, you, you do. just don't. But I started doing a lot of things and getting involved in things I maybe shouldn't have got involved in, and uh, it got to the point where, like me and my brother, we used to go out every weekend and we were always fighting, always getting in fights, probably looking for fights. Right. And yeah, there were a few situations we got in, and it were not 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 nice. You know, it's just. You, you're going out and you think, I best put a fucking red T-shirt on tonight because I'm going to get blood on me. I know I am. And, and you, that's what it was like. And yeah. that's what the mentality was at, at, that, at this period. And right. There were, there were a lot of lads. It, we, it were a, a village mentality. And I presume this is Doncaster we're talking about. Yeah, a little village in Doncaster. Mm. Um, and there were, it was village mentality, which is it's not a bad thing. No. But when you're out and about, everybody knows everybody. Mm. You know, you've only got to say first names and everyone knows who you are and someone does something and, you know, everyone in village has heard that story exaggerated. And mm, yeah. Yeah, it worked. So, yeah, I got it. I'll probably, because I took too, looking back at it, I think, because I was taking too much on and putting too much pressure on myself, I will put myself in situations that I should, maybe shouldn't have been in at that, that age of, of me, at that age of my life. I, I turned to a lot of things and started self-medicating and things like that with alcohol, uh, um, maybe odd recreational drugs and stuff like that. Nothing heavy, you mm. know, nothing heavy, but, mm. you know, stuff that people do when they go out on a weekend and enjoy themselves. And It's a common thing, Nick. Yeah. It's not, you you know, people, and, you know, credit to yourself for for, uh, for saying something like that, you know, it, it it's very common out there yeah. and it's, it's more than you think and less people speak about stuff like this. So, 
you know, and, well and done th- for that. And I think, you know, that's probably what led to the next part of my life being a bit of a, I won't say disaster, but a bit of a learning curve. So that rela- that relationship ended. I was still obviously working for myself, self-employed and things like that, um, on sites and uh, doing people's houses and things like that and fitting bathrooms and kitchens and whatnot. Uh, that first relationship then broke down, you know, just went off on my own, did my own thing. Uh, but again, looking back, I did not know how much damage I was doing to myself, like, not physically, but mentally. You um, don't, you don't, you're young, you're yeah. indestructible, nothing can, nothing can beat you. That's the mentality of, of a, of a young man growing up in yeah. late 90s, early 2000s, but that's how it was. Yeah. And you've got a lot of friends, well, not a lot of friends around you, but people around you that you, you say you're the friends, but I mean, I think this, this day and age, you don't. You can talk more about things, can't you? I don't know if it is this day and age or if it's our age, but you feel more comfortable talking about things like that. 20 years ago, I would not be sat here saying this to you. I think that's because you've you've done it, you've experienced it. Um, hopefully you've put it to bed. Oh, yeah. Do you yeah. know, um, when you go through episodes in life, in, in, in whether that be good, bad or the ugly, once you've once you've completed that and you've learned from it and you've taken advantage of, of what you've learned, then that becomes an easier conversation to speak about. But at the time, you probably don't really know what you're talking about because you don't know what you're going through. No, that's right. And that led on to uh, getting into another relationship. And I was, unbeknown to me at the time, under so much pressure. Um, So how old are we now, Nick? We're talking maybe late 20s, 30s. Right, so you so you've been you've been working on your own for a long time. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. This was my thing yeah, now. This yeah. was, this were embedded in me now. Mm-hmm. This is what this is what I were doing. Um, yeah, and this this was my thing. Um, what sort of thought? Mm. Um, yeah, I got into another relationship, and uh, I just I, I think I just I was suffering mentally, which I didn't know at the time until one episode. Um. I we'd, we'd gone away for a weekend, and then I had something just happened. It was just either something here or there. It was nothing, and that then just straw that broke camel's back for me. It was like the next thing I know, I, I, I'd lost it, and I found myself trying to walk home from Blackpool in in pissing down rain to Doncaster. Wow, me head had gone. It, well, it, literally, I just lost it. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know where I was. I remember passing phone boxes and just trying to ring people like reverse charge. I had nothing on me. Uh, no phone, no money, nothing. Just a T-shirt and a pair of jeans. Um, it's a long walk. If, well, well, yeah. It'll probably take you a couple <laughs> well, of I mean, days. Yeah. I mean, I look back now and I think, what an absolute no mm, bed. Mm, you know, why did mm. you try and do that? But I, it, it just happened. You know, I have no answers for anybody as to why. It, it was just an accumulation of, uh, so much things going on that, that you know that I thought I had control of, which I didn't. Mm-hmm. And my um, sister, or, the only thing I remember was my sister coming to pick me up. Um, and to this day, I don't know where it was or how long she'd driven for. Uh, but it's a good two, two and a half hours from where she lives to Blackpool. Oh, I... So I'm guessing I didn't walk that far. But it felt like... Well, I don't know what it felt like. I, you know, I'm trying to think now what, what was going through my head, but I don't know at the time because I always remember standing on a on a bridge and and just looking over and thinking, yeah, this is this is it. Like, really? Uh, yeah, and that's how bad it was. So um, that's come to a point there of your life where, you know, you, you've pretty much... I'm, I don't like to say you've hit bottom, but... You I know, want, I want a bottom gap. You, you get, yeah. you, you're not far off, you know, and if you're thinking about... But something along them lines of that's as that's as low as it got for me. And I I'm glad your sister picked you up, mate. Yeah, um, and I don't know how many phone calls I'd made and people I'd rang or, uh, from that point of me walking to that point of me standing on that bridge, and I thought, yeah, this is, yeah, I just could, I, I don't know what I was thinking, uh, and eventually I ended up getting it back in my sister's car and driving home, and 
uh, again, I never went, never sought any help or anything like that. I just thought, you know, I can deal with this until then. I went, oh, I thought, you know, someone said to me, you're going to need to speak to a doctor. Uh, and then, yeah, I went to speak to a doctor and got on some medication and stuff like that. Uh, and to this day, I, you know, I still do have little episodes, but I can control it. You know, I can control it. I never get them like, thoughts like I had back then or anything like that but sometimes I could feel anxieties come in and stuff like that and but I think it's just normal anyway it is, especially Nick. in this day it, and age it and is Nick you know I, I, I'm a I'm a as I've spoke as we've spoken before you know um I'm a true believer that everybody goes through some form of this at sometimes in their life if not regular mm. and it's normal yeah and, and once I think once we all agree or believe that these feelings are normal, then yeah. that's that's the coping mechanism that can start from there. And it's in talking about it, like like you say, like we didn't back then, mm-hmm. you know, because you just thought, who do I talk to? What do I say? It, 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 it's a it's an insecurity to say something. You feel weak. You 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 know. Let's let's. I'm a less of a man by talking about it, you know, and things like that. So we never knew, Gav, did we? As I mean, as kids nowadays, they're exposed to a lot of this, and uh, and it's good because they can the the talk about the the maybe the triggers and stuff. What you know, the, how it feels to be depressed or anxious and stuff like that. Mm. As when we were kids, we never learned anything like that. The talk at school now, the talk, yeah. the, 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 the talk. There's lessons like my son at school. He has lessons about life. Yeah, he has lessons about being a good person. Do you know when we were getting brought up, as parents taught us what they thought were right, mm. which nine times out of ten it's not wrong, but it's not everything. Do you know, no one gives you life training. No, it's something that that you're supposed to just know or develop. Yeah, where kids nowadays they do get this. Yeah, and, and yeah, so that. That kind of settled me down a little bit, um, life-wise. Uh, work-wise, I was still on my own, doing my own thing. Still working, yeah? Still working. Um, did a start, I started then partnering up with my uncle. Um, so a bit of familiarity. Yeah, he, 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 he was a massive help, if I'm honest with you. Uh, so, yeah, so we've, we've gone to it with his uncle. Yeah. We've had this episode. Yeah. We've... Like you say, you, you, you've come to the lowest point that you can probably remember. Mm-hmm. So how did you come around it? How how did you move forward from realising that you were at this bottom? I think just a mixture of telling certain people, um, speaking about it. And I think the actual incident itself were a big wake-up call Yeah, because I was able to um, experience it. It was a realization. Yeah, experience it, and mm. then have family like not involved directly, but obviously with my sister picking me up and sitting in that car for that hour, two hours, whatever it was, going back from wherever I was mm. back to Doncaster. Um, the realization of that 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 was a big turning point that helped me get through it because I thought. Would you say it was a wake up call? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like a bit of a wake up call. So that were like obviously an accumulation of everything prior mm. coming to a bit of a head, um, and then you know just happening. Did you slow things down? Did you put things into perspective a little bit more? Um, like you said, you were going out with your pals quite a lot, getting on sauce and whatever. Yeah, did. I did. Did we calm? Did we put things like the classic saying? Did 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 we stop burning the candle at both? Yes, ends? that was one thing I stopped doing was. Um, not so much, yeah, because I'm probably pleasing everybody else, but I think yeah. that's taking away a bit of accountability. So I've got to, I've got to be account accountable for my own actions, yeah. and yeah, I did stop going out as much, and I think that came with age as well. Mm. And I, you know, I don't regret anything, never regret anything, because I think you have to experience what you've been through in life to to be the person you are today. And I love who I am today. You know, I I enjoy my life. I'm happy. I've got everything I want. Um, so, yeah, I would never change anything or I don't regret anything. Good. But... So you've 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 gone to it with your uncle? Yeah, so that lasted a, a, um, a, a couple more years, maybe two, three years. But he, he, he was a massive help because my uncle is very much, uh, there's not much of a massive age difference. Hmm. You know, maybe 10 years. 
Um, so I kind of seen him more of a, a, a more of a brother than an uncle because I'm yeah. I'm the eldest. Yeah. So I've, I've never really had like my brother. You know, I probably looked up to me. Maybe looked up to me. My sister looked up to him, and yeah, yeah. I've never had that. I've always had my dad, but I've always tried to not be my dad. Or, I know what you're saying. I'm yeah. the eldest of, of four, so yeah. I know exactly what you mean. So having that there were, were nice and spending every day with him were nice and I, and I enjoyed it. We had some good times, had some good laughs and we had some good money. Uh, but I just wanted to do something different. I thought it's come a point, I'm settled now. You know, I'm settled down. Now's the time I, I need to challenge myself, but in a good way because... I used to put all my energy into the wrong things before. Yeah. And that's probably what caused all that. Mm. That energy hasn't gone. It's still there. I just need to refocus it. So I thought, what can I do? What's different? Because I'm going to work every day and I feel like I'm just putting it in fucking autopilot. You know, it's just like... Day after day after day. I get yeah. up at seven, I'm pressing the on button. Yeah. I come home at five and I'm pressing the off button. Yeah. And it could be anything happening in between. There's nothing, you know, there's nothing like feeding that energy that I've got. Yeah, so, you, so you've got loads of energy. Yeah. You're so, thinking about, I need a new challenge. So when we felt like we needed this new challenge, Nick, what sort of avenues were you looking at to fulfil this energy that you've got that you want to deliver somewhere else? So obviously based on experiences before, I knew it had to have an element of control to it. Um so it wasn't a case of, right, oh, let's just let's have a lad's holiday or let's just start going out again and burn a bit of energy. Yeah. I had to have a bit of control to it and I knew that because I was getting older and I thought I need to make a wise decision. So I, I focused on a career, different career. Okay. Um, so I put my tools away, uh, hung, me, hung my boats up, as they say. Yeah. Um, and I thought, right, I'm going to go for police. Right. Um why? When it were it were a challenge, and again going back to doing that public service course when I left school. Yeah, that was probably what was in my mind then. Is yeah, I might uh, you know I might join police. So did you think that because you were a bit of a wild nutcase when you were scrapping and that back in Donny? Mm. Did you did you think to you saying like I want to do a role reversal and maybe prevent this type of behaviours or did that into your mind? It, it might have done. It might have done, Gav, but uh, I tried not to think about what I w- were doing in past and yeah. what I got up to and stuff. I, mm. I, I was more probably thinking around the the element of security, job security and things right. like that. So more yeah. of a personal thing and maybe not what the police are involved in, maybe more of a security being, em- yeah. being an employee now after um, being in self-employed for 10 years plus we are now. Yeah, and I think looking at the place from outside looking in, they always had a uh, an element of structure, which I think I was lacking in my life. Right. Um, so, you know, you, you, that hierarchy sort of feeling like you're working for a boss and then he's got a boss and then there's a big boss and then so the there's, there's, that, there's that there, there's that um, element of, being able to uh, look up and see that you can achieve that. A chain that. of command that yeah, comes that, down. It's on the ladder of the steps moving, yeah. up, moving up the business. And I always saw myself as wanting to achieve um, more than maybe what I were capable of. But again, that I don't see that as a bad thing. But no. So I went to an open, an open event for police, South Yorkshire Police, and I sat there and there were a lady at the front. The room was full. There was maybe 70 or 100 um, possible future police uh, men and women there and uh, one of the comments that she made was well, that you needed I can't remember what it was you needed some sort of qualification or some sort of GCSE or some sort of you know MVQ or something mm. in, in a, cer- a certain level to get in and I thought well shit this is me huh? this is me out because that because at school I, I did it I was very good at school up until the last couple of years, and then GCSEs kicked in, I've, I just tossed it off. Right. You can literally spell fuck off with my results. Really? F-U-K-Z. <laughs> all, all, all in maths. <laughs> yeah, and, I, and, I, and I, did, I didn't do well at all, yeah, but I am very 
clever and smart. I, I were always that. I see you as an intelligent man, Nick. Yeah, and I think it were a rebellious streak, just rewinding a little bit to school. I think it were a bit of a rebellious streak in me because I was always in that position of, I've got two younger siblings, I've got parents I want to make proud, and that, that in itself is pressure. Mm-hmm. And going through school always being, oh, you know, there's that always that saying where if we had a room teacher, teachers, parents eating, and teachers are saying, if, Oh, we, if only we had a room full of Nicks, you know, it'd be great. Or Right. At the time, you don't know the saying it to every kid. Mm, yeah. But I'm taking it literally, as you do as a kid, and I'm like putting pressure on myself to be that best kid and be that perfect kid at the time. And then you get to like a certain age, like maybe year nine, 10 and 11, you think, oh, yeah, I'm going to try them cigarettes. I'm going to stay out and drink some Frosty Jacks down at park tonight and... <laughs> I'm going to get involved in some shit with my mates and we're going to set some fires and yeah, this is great. You know, I'm getting as much tension as, as much tension now off my friends yeah, than I wore off my parents for being a good kid, but I'm enjoying myself, you know. And So you're feeling the pressure from, you know, like you got, like your school, you got to, you, you want to prove to your parents, you've mm. got two younger siblings underneath you looking up to Nick. Yeah. Um, Nick gets fed up of this. Yeah. So Nick goes rebellious. Yeah. So there's there's a bit of a sort of a trend here, isn't there? So when you were younger, you were a bit rebellious, you know. Yeah. Bit of this, bit of that. And then as you've gone through, you've you've gone to work to and fro and with your old man in a retail, and then towards back end of when you've been settled in your role as a as as a brickie, you've yeah. done it again. Yeah. So you've gone out with your pals now, so you're a little bit older, you can go get a beer in you, you're gonna wear a red t shirt just because you know you're gonna get gonna get some blood all over yeah, you. Yeah. So there seems to be a little bit of a a, yeah. du- a double a double trend there. So, and that's like I said, that's, I, I I identified, you know, the, there were some problems, and that's why my refocus had to be on a career, and you know, put it into put my energy into that. And like I said, going back to what what I was just talking about with the police, the uh, qualification side of it, and just put a it put a full stop on it for me. Really. So I walked out of there, and I were. I were I were upset, but I thought, you know what, stay positive because there might be something else. You know, I've still got my trade. Yeah, yeah. still got my uncle there who, yeah. you know, um, who, who, who were helping me out at the time. Um, and then I seen an advert on Facebook for prison, prison officers. Right. I thought, you know, this is probably the next best thing. You know, they, they look like policemen. You know, they've got, they've got a <laughs> uniform. Yeah. And, and, and I, and I like the idea of u- uniforms and... Not in a fetish kind of way, you know. I'm not gonna <laughs> say, "Pull, I've got, I've got random uniforms in my wardrobe and get dressed up on a Saturday night." But <laughs> I like the idea of that um, environment and being in that environment, and again, say that having that hierarchy and uh, just, just it's more formal. Yes, it, it, it's, like it's a more formal yeah. environment. Yeah, exactly. I, I, I like, I like the idea of that. I didn't know how much I'd like it because I'd obviously I'd never <laughs> dipped my toes in it. I was always wearing scruffy clothes. Mm. Covered in, build it, yeah. covered in brick dust, covered in... Hands are filthy. So it was kind of a massive switch. You know, I'm not getting dirty anymore, yeah. so... So, with you... So, police is a no-go due to whatever that was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. qualifications or whatever. You couldn't lock yourself up. I think you were just trying to lock yourself up, Nick, weren't you? So let's be quite honest with you. It's, it's a safer environment if I just come a policeman, I'll lock myself yeah, down. Yeah. So, you're thinking about going into the prison service, right? And, and if... I mean, I've got a couple of friends that, have, that are in, that are in prison service. So I've got one, one it's still in the prison service and I've had other friends that have been in there. And it's, that is <clears throat> probably stereotypically one of the toughest jobs you could ever apply for. So what I'm going to ask you is, did you have any insight? Did you have any friends that were in prison service? Did you know anything about it before you looked and applied, I guess, which I know you did? to be a, a prison officer? Short answer is no. So, um, yeah, I knew nobody. Um, and I, and that was one of the reasons, obviously, to make that move because I'd always surrounded myself with comfort in work. Yeah. Like, like I said, mm. going back to my dad and working with my uncle and working within a village that I, ever, that I knew everybody. Didn't you think, well... I mean, to jump out of your comfort zone completely, as as you've just said, I mean... Being a prison officer, mm. that's more than jumping out of your comfort zone because that's an industry that's yeah 
it, it, in all types of the word, it, it, it's a unco- very uncomfortable place to work. I'm guessing. I, I mean, we've all seen it on telly. Whether that does it justice or what, I don't know. But it, it's a violent. It, it's a violent environment. It's a confrontational environment. Yeah. This is what we think. So, d- did you have no fear of of, of applying for this? N- well, yeah, obviously at the time I did. I was nervous, scared, but I thought, you know what, you just, you've just got to jump. And uh, we did a twelve week um, training course. Well, that's a lot, isn't it? Yeah, and that kind of puts the it gives you a little insight, but it's the old. Um, you, you, the old saying where they say you, you'd learn the job on the job, you know. I think that's most jobs. Then, to yeah, be fair. and you, you learnt nothing in those 12 weeks. They were a failing recruitment process. At the time, they were just trying to get the numbers up for the prison officers because the government had taken X amount off them uh, and they were going to give them Y amount back, right. you know, so. So you've had your 12 weeks training yeah. and you don't know right much. Right. I know nothing. Right, so so we know nothing. Yeah. So you've got your uniform on, which you wanted. Yeah. All right. Yeah, yeah. You're pretty much shitting yourself. Tell me your first day when you walked onto that landing and you're in charge of criminals of probably all walks of life and criminality. Yeah. How was it? Horrible. But yeah, it were, it were, it wasn't very nice, and I wanted to turn around and walk out. I'm, I'm I'm surprised you didn't. Because when you walk into a prison, obviously it, it, it's an enclosed environment and there's the same people are there every day, day in, day out. So it, the prisoners know when somebody new is on the wing, right. whether that be a civilian, whether that be a new member of staff uh, or a visitor for, for whatever reason. They know and they will play up to that. So it's the loudest you've ever heard anything. You know, I've worked on building sites with diggers and drills and all sorts and big it, machinery, you know, big machinery right? and mm. you walk into there and it's it kind of takes your breath away because they know who you are and they just start banging doors and screaming and making threats from behind doors and stuff to try and intimidate you and that's what they do from the get go is to try and get under and your how skin. did you feel when you first walked through them doors I just yeah petrified if I'm honest with you petrified <laughs> really scared but luckily for me... And uh, which prison was this, by the way? It was Lindon Prison in Doncaster, so that's a Category C prison. Uh, and Category C is, in comparison to A, what is Category C? Is that a, is that a high security prison? Is no, it? so Category A is high security. Right, okay. Um, so it's, the, it's the, obviously based on the risk of escape okay. and risk to the public, but you still get anything in there from four years to life. So, so there's some serious people in there. And it's an adult estate, so it's 21 years and above. Right. Um, so, yeah, you do get all walks of life in there, mm. all types of criminals in there. Um, but what put me at ease was my supervising officer at the time um, and my CM at the time. CM, which is? Custodial manager. Okay. Um, they were they were writ like immune to the environment. And looking up to them and thinking... You know how do you how do you deal with that? I always remember the first time on the landings when it was a it was a Saturday, so there was association time, which means all the prisoners are just out on the wing, associating with each other, playing pool, walking around the yard and stuff. And there's four or five officers on each side of the wing, just patrolling landings and answering any queries that the prisoners may have and stuff. And I was talking to one young lad, I was a prisoner. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the conversation was vaguely based on like uh, when did I start how long have I been here you know just that in New York we're kind of New York wing mm. and then all of a sudden he just grabbed his grabbed his ear like put his hand up to his ear and what had happened was someone had come up behind him with a razor blade melted into a ruler and sliced his ear right in front of you yeah right in front of me and I looked down Cause he looked down and I'm like, what's just happening? I've seen, I've seen a, bit, a bit, bit of commotion and you know, you've got to imagine the landings are like a meter wide and so there's, there's people, no room, you know, there's people moving and pushing past you, and you all the time. And they do, they do bang into it just to try and test you and things like that. And then I thought, fuck's that on floor. He's here, we're on floor. Wow. 
So I press my alarm on my radio. You have a, a little button on your radio. And it's I guess your, like a panic button, I guess. Yeah, it's your personal alarm. So you press that and then <clears throat> uh, comms will come over of it net and say, personal alarm gone off on officer, where it? So I've told him to pick his ear up, took him into the sterile area, um, put everyone away, banged everybody up, locked, locked the wing down. And I've gone back into the sterile area and uh, the CM at the time, he walked down and I'm stood, stood there looking at this lad who's got his ear in his hand and getting bandaged up by two nurses. And everybody's like laughing and joking and the, the guy's got a smile on his face who's, who's ears up in his hand and my CM at the time came walking down the stairs because their officers were on up on top floor. What's gone off here then, Nick? Uh, so, and I'm white as a sheet. I'm like... This is your first day? This is my first day live, yeah. First so day I'd live on spent, London, yeah. I'd already spent some time buddying. Right, you know, but this is your first, first day live. Yeah. First day on job, shall first we call it? experience with yeah. my own keys yeah. and stuff like that. Uh, and he says to the prisoner, what's gone off, lad? Are, are you all right, like? And he stood there with his ear in his hand. The prisoner just, because he'd been bandaged up on his head, he couldn't hear him. Mm. So he'd lent me, the, the manager at the time, then lent down to his hand. And spoke into his ear and his hand saying, can you hear me now? What's up? Are you all right? <laughs> and everyone just started laughing. I thought, Christ, you know, what have I got myself into? But and, went, and why do you think they were laughing? Is this how they, is this how, is this how they you know, mentalise it? You know, because yeah. they can't think too serious about what's going on? Or That's, is it, or is, are they just, I don't want to say this, but are they just cruel people? They just don't care about him. I mean... That's the environment it is. And I quickly... I quickly found out you have to become immune to it. You have to you have to switch on when you go in there and then try and switch off when you walk out them gates. Is it, that possible? No. No. And and that's probably why I'm I'm now working for the media company that we both work for. Is because it's not possible. Um I had a couple of promotions uh, okay. within there. Uh with in that role, uh, I became part of the standards coaching team, which took me down to um, London, to the House of Parliament, met Rory Stewart. Um, mm. That were interesting, but challenging, because mm. I'd only been there two minutes, and there's, there's officers that have been there years, and their mindset was, this guy's going to come and tell me how to do my job, when I wasn't. But right. that... And you can't blame them for thinking that because that's probably how it was fed back to them that uh, the standards coaching team are going to come and change things and do this or other, but it wasn't about that. And so, why did why did you get this role? Then what did you do to achieve this this, so, this promotion within such a short period of time? Yeah. So from the onset, the the aim was to keep my name relevant and promote myself, not not just by applying for jobs but promote myself within the role that I was doing as an officer okay so always you know just be the best I could be every day you know smartly dressed doing my hair every day and mm. looking smart making sure I got my tie on it, you know it's a requirement but not many officers at the time and there were little clip on ties for for obviously for safety yeah, reasons yeah. yeah and officers used to clip it on the on the shirt pocket and say well I have got my tie on just you know, well, it's not hard just to look smart, is it? And Give the right iron, impression. Iron your trousers, put a crease down the middle. Yeah. Keep your crease as nice and neat on your shirt and just mm. look... Professional. Professional. And by doing that, I guess I kind of stood out. Mm. Um, but I were always professional in what I did and I always tried to do my best. And, uh, yeah, um, I was handpicked from the governor at the time uh, to go on to the standards coaching uh, team. And then off the back of that, I got a um, SO role, supervising officer role. And then you see it in a different light then because you're not just dealing with prisoners, you're dealing with staff as well uh, and the pressures that come with that. And in what time scale are we talking here, Nick? So from... 18 months. So you, so you got through these two promotions in 18, 18 months. months. Yeah. So you could fairly say it could probably take a standard well, not standard, but a prison officer, to learn to be a prisoner officer 18 months. Mm. I mean, you know, I'm guessing being a pr prison officer, you've got to gain the respect of the prisoners. Yeah. Because am I right in saying in all fairness, you know what, the prisoners could be running that prison in their own way which you've got to tackle? 
Prisons are run by prisoners. I would, I would a, probably. There's just an element of trust there, and the numbers don't make sense. No, you know, there's. Well, you just said that you had five, five, five officers to maybe 150 to 200 prisoners. So the ratio is not so, good. Yeah, there's, a, you know, you're talking a thousand prisoners at Lindon, uh, and maybe two, three hundred staff. Really? Yeah. Um, if they want to turn it over, they'll turn it over. But the, the 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 procedures and policies that we have in place in a prison, or that, that that they had in place in a prison, prevent that from happening. So I want to ask you a question, Nick. And you yeah. know, we do work for a media company, and we are both coaches. Yeah. Which is what we do now. Mm-hmm. Which involves you know talking to people, you know, yeah, getting yeah. the best out of people. So let's take this element. Maybe not coaching as such, but it probably could be back to the prison service. So you've got the, all these promotions within eighteen months, which is a which is a, a a great thing that you've done. But what I want to know is is when you're in that environment of being a prison officer and you're looking after all these people, and these people are in there for not good reasons. Okay, how did you go out there and gain their trust or be able to work with these people? But because for you to jump to promotions in eighteen months, you must be doing something right. Mm-hmm. You must be running that or running that wing, shall we say, you know, or supporting that wing in in the most great way. So tell me, how did you build that relationship? It's easy, it's easier building relationships with with non-prison, yeah. you know, yeah, people so, like we do today. So prison, it's a, it is a, a funny thing, especially for outsiders to look in and think, you know, they do deserve to be there for whatever they've done you know, or whatever it may be. But my job is to not remind them of that. Prison's about rehabilitation, or so it should be. Mm. The punishment is the the sentence, you know. We shouldn't be punishing them while they're in there. They're, they're serving the time. And they're only human beings, you know. We all make mistakes. I, for, I, for one, could have been in prison, you know, numerous times. But I'm lucky there's things you might have done in your past and you're lucky. Um, so, yeah, it's about treating them with a bit of humanity uh, and not going back over old. You know, I, I can look at somebody's record and say, right, this this guy has done some nasty things, you know, he's, and you do, you can't help because that's, 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 that's the human nature of it. You want to know what somebody's in for and you have to know what somebody's in for for a... For safety reasons, you know, we see what you're dealing with, but it's a rehabilitation process is being in prison and serving your time should be enough punishment for them. So just just being normal with them and talking to them like I would talk to somebody that I've just walked out of a shop that I've just come out of and have a conversation with them about normal things and just being myself because prisoners don't want that iron fist mentality, like, you can do as I tell you, or this is going to happen. You know, they've had that punishment already by getting told they're going to be in there for mm. six, seven, eight, nine, ten years, whatever. Mm. That's punishment in itself. You know, they're not going anywhere. So let's just treat them with a bit of dignity. And people might be controversial. People might think they don't deserve it. They should be locked up and, you know, treat like shit while they're in there. But that's going to do nothing for them because we're going to release these people back into the population and we should do our best as prison officers and as a prison in itself to try and change that mentality of that person. We don't want the same person going out that came in and by treating them like shit, they're just going to come out even worse. And granted, it's an hard thing to do and that's what got me frustrated on a daily basis Mm. because you see him prick the same prisoners getting released and then to Two months later, they're back Revolving in. Revolving door. They're coming back in, and whether that's for getting paid, you know, because mm. they'll come with drugs stuffed up them and stuff like no. that, and phone stuff up, them, stuffed yeah. up them, and they'll just go and finish the um, sentence inside, but they'll come out with five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten grand. Right. Um, but yeah, it was frustrating. Uh, but yeah, just gaining that trust is just just by being normal with them and talking to them. Be about, just by being a human, humanizing yeah. it. Yeah. 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 Treating them normal. Right. Right, so we've got these three promotions and we are, what did we say we were again, sorry? The 
Supervising officer. Supervising SO, officer. Yeah. So what is a supervisor? Is that is that looking after staff, I guess? Yeah. And being a prison officer as well? Yeah, so uh, 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 an, an average wing at Lindholm is made up of, uh, from top down, is custodial manager. Okay. So that's the CM. Then you have a supervising officer and nine members of staff, a uh, cleaning officer, and then your, your wing guards. Um and so that's that was my role at the time. So looking after the staff and and prisoners, uh, and I enjoyed it. I really did enjoy it. Um, but it just got to a point where you, you're driving to work and you think, "Am I going to get home tonight?" Or you know, right. "Am I am I going to see this day?" And how old are we now, Nick? Um. So. What I've been with this company now for three years, and I was probably only in the prison service for two and a half, three years. So this is you're talking like six years ago. So mid thirties, you know. And I presume you're a family man at this point. Yeah, yeah. Um, so got, it, got a son. Yeah. Um, and when I started thinking like that, I, uh, my my partner, she. Just got pregnant with my daughter. Yeah. Uh, and I didn't like having those thoughts driving to work. As much as I loved the job, as much as I was Mr. Prison Service and I wanted that next promotion and I was going to do everything I could to get to probably governor level, I had to wait up again. And that were another hard decision because I really did enjoy working in, in prison service. But then... But to have that thought of... Am I going to come home today? Yeah, is my partner going to get a call? And I mean, she worked in prison service, right, so okay. um, that helped because uh, she understood everything. She was a governor at the time, right? And um, I just didn't. I just stopped enjoying traveling to work and coming home. You can't. I, I'm guessing that you can't have that anticipation and fear. And do and fulfil your role as a as a as a prison officer, because I'm guessing if you are going to go in there with with fear and and doubt, uh, you could make mistakes. Yeah. And if the prison officers, uh, sorry, and if if the prisoners see this weakness, oh yeah, they're going to prey on it. And I'm the, guessing. Yeah, they do. And the thing is, I got good at hiding that, and I think that's why I enjoyed it because I could switch off. Mm. Don't matter what I'd said or what I'd been through before I walked in them gates in the morning, as soon as I walked through them gates, it were like, it were like, you know, stars in their eyes. Yeah, yeah. It were like that, you, you know. You turned into to Nick the prison officer. Yeah, T- tonight, Matthew, I'm going to be. And then I'd walk through the gates and I, and I literally could just switch like switch that. Switch it on. Uh, what I found out was switching off. Yeah. Um, did you did you sometimes take take work home? You couldn't not. You, you had to, because you see things in there... Um, that people spend a lifetime without seeing. Well, on your first day, you saw yeah. someone cut somebody else's ear off. Yeah, you, you see. You know, not the average Joe sees that, unless it, you're watching telly. It's not so much, I think, what did it for me? Well, not so much seeing it. It was not being able to deal with it. Because you see people, you see people, you see dead people, you see people mm. trying to, hang themselves, self-harming, people yeah. sticking forks in the leg and under the skin and swallowing batteries and cutting the throats and things like that. And, and you can't prevent it. There's nothing There's nothing you can do. And it's when then things sort of happen, you've then just got to, all right, then that's happened. Let's just crack on, get back on with it because you've got another 250 prisoners that just want to get on with the day mm. and we've got to make that happen. You can't just go off and have a sit down and take all your staff off at wing and think, you know, let's go and have a carvery and have a talk about this and give each other a cuddle. There's none of that. You've yeah, just got so to switch so back there, in. So there's no debrief on anything to yeah. talk about how you feel. Well, there'll be de- I mean, there will be debriefs and stuff like that on any events. Mm-hmm. You know, you give a debrief and, you, you know, you discuss how you're going to... But you can't, you can't just... You know, the, 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 that could happen in the morning, let's say, for example. Mm. You've got another eight, nine hours to go of 
normality. But you've got to make it normal for these prisoners. And having witnessed someone mm. hanging from back of the toilet, you know, it's hard to get that out of your head and then carry on as normal because someone's asking you for a bar of soap and kicking off because you haven't given them a toothbrush and a bar of soap. And I guess taking these, this this type of thoughts or home, mm. I guess that's not a good thing. No, it's not. I, could, I reckon it could be, you could have quite a toxic mind, for example, or... I mean, it, I think it's probably a, a fortunate thing that your partner works in the similar sort of environment so you can Definitely. relate to, a, to to your partner that works at, at somewhere else. They don't understand, so mm. probably that would help, but you can't both be bringing home the, the same yeah. thought process, and I bet that was tough at times, and that's probably, yeah, I'm guessing, and, why you made a decision. Yeah, and obviously I was fortunate. I'd say fortunate, but you know, it wasn't nice at the time, but I was fortunate enough to go through... Um, what I went through early in life to kind of make me aware that I needed to pull myself out of that situation and it just wasn't worth it. I didn't want to die at work and I didn't want to start having those thoughts and those worries because I knew I would just end up suppressing it. Mm. Uh, but that would come out at a later date in a different form. So you've learned So I learned from that, yeah. You've learned from your past yeah. as well. And that's what led me on to uh, doing what I'm doing now. So... We work for a media company right now. Yeah. So you've left the prison service. Yeah. You've done it for the. You, you've you've been promoted well. You've your career path within the prison service was was on the up. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you've you've been promoted three times in the space of three years, shall we say? So yeah. now three years, whatever. And then you decided to work for the media company that we work for now. Yeah. So just as a, a little bit of a transition. So we've had three major roles. We've worked in a shoe shop. We've we, we didn't like that. We've been a bricky, we've been on building site for 10 plus years. We've jumped in at prison service, we've flown with that. And now we work for this media company that we both work for. There's no, there's no, there's no, it's, everything's different, Nick, innit? You know, <laughs> there's no flow of, there's of, no of flow. anything. It's no. like, so I'm guessing because you challenged yourself once before, jumped, you know, f flee in the nest and yeah. bang straight into prison yeah, service. Yeah. And you come and work for this media company. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Tell me why. You, you, why did the media company about? What, 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 sorry, why did the media company come to you and what's it all about? Um, again, you touched on it there. I just wanted another challenge and something. You like to be challenged, don't you? Yeah, Nick? I do. Um, and I thought, you know what? Um, what can I do? And again, I think it. I've seen an advert on, on one at socials again for. Uh, recruiting and I thought well what 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 could it? I was still at the prison service at the time I thought well what arm would it do if I just went along or applied and then you know what arm would it do if I got an interview or the I think it was like a day like a, yeah, uh, like a day, a day thing they held yeah, yeah, and yeah. there were little activities and things like that I yeah. thought well you know I'll just go and like an open day sort yeah, of thing. Like, yeah, I'll, yeah I'll go and attend that yeah um and yeah, it just came along at the right time uh, because obviously I, I was wanting to get out of prison service and I just had a little girl uh, and I didn't want to, you know, have the thoughts I were having. So yeah, I went along. I thought, again, new challenge is the possibilities of uh, career progression within this within this company. And I looked at it and I thought, well, yeah, there probably is. Big enterprise, yeah, big organisation. You know, and it's it's something different. So, yeah, I, I, I went along, applied for it, got the job, went and, well, came came to it, did some training. Yeah. Um, Again, you get sort of like 15 weeks training. Yeah, yeah. Um, bit different though. And then, yeah, it's a bit different. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, I've gone from people slitting the throats because we're taking the telly off them out of the cell. And I'm now dealing with Margaret down road who's moaning that she can't get a signal, hmm. you know. Mm. On, on her TV and it's like it's a, it, a massive contrast it's all relative you know so I can't take that into someone might be upset because they've been sent so and so from they've been sent from venue A to venue B and they don't mm. like the distance about to travel and I'm still got these thoughts in my head thinking well two weeks ago I was cutting some lad down because we gave him fish yeah, for tea yeah, yeah. and he wanted steak mm. you know or 
So yeah, so you've you you've been with this media company now for is it about three three and a half years, Nick? Four years? Are we talking? Yeah, so it'll have been three years. February this year. Three years so February. Nearly three and a half years. Yeah. So you were on the road for two years. Yes. Yeah. And we both do the same role as in coaching. Coaching, yeah. Coaching, training, whatever. Yeah. Whatever that comes down to. And you sort of you. I see you, which I, which I have seen you work, and and I think you're good at what you do, and I suppose you've 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 had this coaching element in you, probably longer than you've done it with Sky, because I think that you've been, like you said, when you when, when you're rehabilitating within prison service, that that that's coaching lifestyles, I guess, yeah. you know, asking open questions and 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 talking to people as human beings, you know, not telling them what they've got to do, but can you? Mm. You know, so I, and and how do you feel your life is right now within within the coaching world and and within your and within your career? Yeah, I think it's good. Um, it's settled, mm. which I like. Um, I've got you know things I'm looking forward to. I've got a new child on the way. Yeah, you and have a boy. He's he's due anytime. anytime so that's great. Yeah. Uh, you know, relationships great. It, it, I couldn't I couldn't really be. In a better place. That's um, good. Enjoy what I'm doing. Love doing these podcasts. Um, Very successful. Yeah, love talking to people and hearing their stories because from past experiences, I know everyone's got a story. Everybody else um, has got a story, and that, and this is and this is your story. Yeah, it? and it's it's about sharing it, and then there might be somebody out there listening, thinking, yeah, it's. I'm I'm looking forward to people listening to this podcast yeah. because you're the host of this podcast. You know, before, you know, once everybody's heard this, I bet they're not going to really think that they're going to hear what you've been talking about today because with you being the host, I bet people think that you've got to make it bigger than what it is and you haven't. Yeah. You've just been yourself. You've been natural. You've, you know, you're honest and relatable to what everybody else has spoke to you in the past. So, yeah. you know what? Um, well done for that. Thank you. So. Yes. Just before I go into the uh, famous five quick fire questions, oh, Nick. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> so I know you. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, probably people that are going to listen to this podcast within the company that I work for know you, but there's going to be people out there that don't. Mm. Tell the listeners something that they won't know about you. Uh, something interesting. Or yeah, something yeah. Different. I know how it works, Gav. How I do all this show. <laughs> I'm trying to build it up, Nick. I'm trying to build it up for the big bang. This better be good now. If no, you're no, good, this no, better no. be good. It's. I mean, I'm, there's a lot of things that's interesting about me, but I've, I were on TV once. Um, you were on Crime Watch, were you? Something very similar. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was one of these, um, you know, like these Channel 5 things where they follow emergency services around. Yeah. I think it were an ambulance one. Uh, and I was out in Doncaster. You won't blab in the background with your red T-shirt on, were you? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I won't blab it. Um, I remember seeing a camera and I thought, oh, you know, it was just like a magnet. I'd just drawn straight to it. And I'd been to a, um, Flares. Do you remember Flares, the clubs? Well, they used to be winning Leeds, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's Flares like a 70s, 70s speed thing. Yeah, yeah. And every time you got a drink, you could buy something like some stupid glasses or yep. a big fake yep. handlebar moustache. Yeah. Big, 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 yeah, big doers and yeah, stuff yeah. like that. I had a moustache, but I'd, what I'd done is I'd ripped it in half and put one on each eyebrow. <laughs> so I had these massive bushy bushy eyebrows. And I just ran up to the camera and started talking a lot of rubbish and dancing and doing loads of <laughs> shit in front of the camera. And then I thought not of it. I think about six months later, I remember sat watching this programme and there I was. I thought of water. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I've been on telly. I've, right. I've, I've Brilliant. been on telly. Brilliant. Right, so what we all need to do now is let's have a look for this channel on YouTube or something and find Nick with his <laughs> uh, with his moustache on his eyebrows. Yeah, you know, being, some archive, being a tool somebody, of himself yeah. on telly. <laughs> right, Nick, finally. Quick fire questions. Quick fire. All right. Okay. So, question one. Oh, I'm dreading this. What is your greatest achievement so far? Well, you know, I always hear things like this and I always used to think, oh, that's cliche, that's soppy. But my kids, mate, I think my mm. kids, 
uh, and my greatest achievements in life. Good so shout. Far. Good yeah. shout. What was you afraid of as a child? Uh, That's question two. Mm. Now, we know a story from before when you were having nightmares about Emma Dale characters, <laughs> yes. which is the weirdest thing I've probably ever heard in my life. <laughs> right? However, we need something else. Is there anything else? Yeah, I think... I think failing caused me a, a lot of pain as a As kid. a child? Yeah, as a child, mate. Even then, I'd never wanted to fail at anything. So you're a competitive child? Yeah, um... I mean, that's a bit, probably a bit deep in it for a, a kid's thing, I think. So you're five years old, Nick? Five what, years old. Five, six years yeah. old, because I think I think childhood memories for me, I go back to about five or six earliest ones. So let's say between five and ten years old or 12 years I, old. I always remember what were you being, afraid of? being scared of um, roller coasters. Because really? Because one of my uncles at the time I had great pleasure in taking the absolute piss out of me because I used to only go on teacups. <laughs> and it wasn't until I was a little bit older that I thought, you know, I'm going to have to just grit my teeth and get on one of these, this nemesis or whatever it is. Uh, but yeah, I think roller coasters and things like that. I think everybody's, I think mm. everybody's afraid of it. And so, I mean, I remember going to Flamingo Land when I was a kid. Yeah. I, went, I wouldn't go on out and then I went on Corkscrew. Remember Corkscrew? Yeah. <laughs> and, I, and I were absolutely bricking it. In fact, I think I were crying to get off it, you know, probably 10 or something like that. I think yeah. I was just old enough and tall enough to get on it. Yeah. And I got on it and I loved it. That's it, isn't it? It's I just, never looked back since I went on it about 14 it, times it? in a row because it was quiet um, question three two celebrity guests you invite to your dinner party past dead mm-hmm. present okay. two celebrities so one of them 100% Ayrton Senna Ayrton Senna yeah massive massive F1 fan uh, and I always remember watching it on a Sunday uh, with my dad I always used to turn it up full blast. So at the start, Murray Walker. V10. Go, 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 yeah, go. V10. My dad had that yeah. TV, TV upturn full blast, and that's what got, you know, Mansell days, Senna yeah, days, yeah, and things yeah. like that. Yeah. And Senna, what a guy, you mm. know, and he died too soon, bless him, but I'd love him to be there. Um, present? Uh, present. I think someone like Barack Obama. Right. Because, obviously, he's been through a lot of adversity and things like that, and to get to where he got to in life, um, yeah, I'd love to hear some of his stories of what he's, you know, how he's achieved things and the, his mentality that he had at the time. What about his career progression? Yeah. Of what we spoke about today, yeah. you know, speaking about yourself and your career, look at his career. I know. Was he, if I'm right, saying the first ever black president of it the was. United States of America? Yeah, he was, yeah. Um, Which that's an absolute achievement. In, that's you know, that's a barrier. That, that is some barrier to break down. And it certainly he is. He did it. I, and I, I just think he was such an amazing, amazing character to listen to. And I always go back to some of his videos when he's done speeches and stuff like that. So, I'd, yeah, I'd love him. So, Ayrton Senna and... Barack that would, I could, you know what, that that would be an interesting That'd dinner be... party, or to put it in Yorkshire terms, as tea. <laughs> yeah, you know that that'd that, be a re- that tea. That'd be a, that would be that'd be an interesting. So you've got an absolute. Uh, Etten Et- Et- Centre was the pinnacle of motorsport. Yeah, absolute nutcase, no fear. You know, would die on a racetrack, and you yeah. know, unfortunately, he did. You know, by and then you got Barack Obama, who's mm. a complete. Opposite, you know, yeah. of polit- of politics and yeah, and presidency, and oh, 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 can you imagine that conversation? You're sat in the middle. That'd yeah, be good, a beaut, wouldn't it? Good piss up that. <laughs> <laughs> so, question four: Would you rather be able to speak every language on the in in the world, okay. or be able to talk to animals? Mm. That's an interesting one. So, so I can still speak the language I speak now, but talk to animals as well. Yeah. Yes, it? Would you rather be able to speak every language in the world or would you rather be able to talk to animals? Probably every language in the world. Why? Because I think it'd get you further. I, I don't think no one's interested in knowing what an horse thinks. 
Have you ever oh, thought? Oh, what have, a slug have, feels. Have you ever had a? Have you have you have you got a dog? You got a dog. I've got a dog. And you ever thought to yourself, what's your dog thinking? I know what my dog's thinking. What does he tell you? <laughs> I just know it look on its face. But can you imagine what if he if he could talk at times? Well, what, yeah. what he would say? Yeah, I don't think I'd like to know what he'd say. <laughs> Throw the ball, 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 throw the ball. <laughs> right, question five. When I find it. Who is your inspiration and why? Uh, see, I, I had this question asked to me a couple of weeks ago and I found it hard to answer then. And I'll, I'll tell you why, because I try not to be inspired I, well, I do. People do inspire me, but I try not to look at it too much because I worry that I might do things the way that person's doing it, and I've got my own journey to be on. Mm-hmm. And what I do should be good enough, and how I do it should be good enough. Um, but I guess my partner, she 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 inspires me a lot because she's got me through a lot. She doesn't even know that, but she has. Mm-hmm. Um. She'd be glad to hear that. Yeah, and everything she's gone through and things like that. Um, but yeah, she's she's a strong character. You know, she's she's good at her career. She's she's doing well in her career. Uh, and yeah, if I was half the person she is, yeah, that'd be a good good outcome. It's a good shout. Yeah, yeah. It's a good shout. Yeah. So, well done, Nick. Oh, thank you. Gav needs to know today, but can I have my chair back. <laughs> you can. <laughs> But just going forward, Nick, Nick needs to know some more. So, yes. um, well done for today. Thank you. I think you've been truly honest, which is what yeah. people want to hear. Yeah. And I wish you all the best. Thank you very in much. In your future podcasts. Thank well, you. Well done, mate. Cheers, Gav. Bye bye. See you later. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to hit that follow button and join me next time for more chats on Nick Needs to Know.